everyone, and welcome to Gruff Talk, where each week we take a deep dive into all the ways we can feel better, look better, live better, and age better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. So what if I told you that there was something that half the world's population experiences, that this something wreaks havoc with the hearts, brains, bones, vaginas, sleep, sex lives, skin, eyes, hair, and so much more of these people. And that this something isn't something that might happen to some of those people, but is something that absolutely happens to every single one of them. And what if I told you that this something is viewed as a taboo, often embarrassing thing to talk about, and is still in the year 2022, swept under the rug. And what if I told you that more than 75% of these people don't seek help for their symptoms, the vast majority of which are treatable? And lastly, what if I told you that there are a heck of a lot of healthcare providers out there who don't discuss any of this with those people, don't offer help, and basically ignore the quiet suffering. And what if I told you these people who are at their absolute prime of life quit jobs because it's sometimes too hard to get through a day without feeling absolutely awful and lacking in all support? Wouldn't you be furious? You know already, of course, that the people I'm talking about are women, and the something I'm talking about is menopause. For too long, women have suffered in silence, way, way too long. But good news for all the women who are just starting the menopause journey and every woman coming after, menopause is finally having its moment thanks to bold, brave, and positively pissed off women like my guest today. Stacey London is one of America's foremost style experts. She is best known as, oh God, we loved her on the show, as the co-host of TLC's iconic show, What Not to Wear. I have to tell you, my two daughters and I, we never missed an episode. Following the success she hosted and executive produced three seasons of Love, Lust, or Run. And Stacey has written two books, Dress Your Best, which was published to stellar reviews, and The Truth About Style, which I have. It's just beautiful and fabulous, a New York Times bestseller. In 2020, she hosted a podcast discussing mental health called Could Be Better in collaboration with the Crisis Text Line and the Jed Foundation. In 2021, Stacy became the founder and CEO of State of Menopause, a holistic product line for women which addresses the symptoms associated with menopause and perimenopause. In this new phase of her career, Stacy is doing what she has done her entire career as a stylist. She is helping people from suffering silently. She's raising their confidence and self-esteem by alleviating external symptoms and removing the shame that surrounds them. We just recorded the most incredible conversation. So I suggest you all just kind of grab a glass of wine or a cup of tea, put your feet up, put in your earbuds, listen in, and just, yeah, prepare to be absolutely inspired. Hey, Stacey, thank you so much for joining Gruff Talk. Hey, Barbara, thanks so much for having me. It's so, I actually want to call you like, hey, Gruff, what's up? You know, like, yeah, hey, call call me Gruff. You can be a Gruff gal. A Gruff gal, I want to be a Gruff gal. Yeah, Laura Geller, who's the makeup maven, she was on the show and I've known her for like decades at this point, just a lovely, lovely woman. And she has that great line of makeup. She's amazing. And she calls all the people who love her makeup, Geller gals. Yeah, so on the show, like we decided girls, I can rock ladies. I yeah. mean, we have rough gals. I love, <laughs> yeah. I love a rough gal. Yeah. So I have to start off. I know we, we're going to be talking about menopause, which is yeah. super duper important. And we know that we're going to go into that and take a deep dive. But I have to tell you, and I actually did tell you this already when we met uh, not too long ago at an event about menopause. But My daughters have two daughters. They're both in their 20s at this point. We never missed an episode, not a single episode of What Not to Wear. We remain probably your number one, two, and three biggest fans. And we just (laughs) loved it, loved it, loved it. And I know that you have 
you know, moved away from that and you've Mm -hmm. moved into a very important arena and we are so happy that you have. But just like talk to us a little bit about that. What are your feelings about that? I know you must be very, still very associated with the show. I'm completely associated with the show. I will never, it's like, I'm never going to scrape the show off my shoe. Do you know what I mean? Like it's there, it's permanent. And in one sense, I really appreciate that. Like I, I love when I hear that, you know, you watched it with your daughters or that people would sit on the phone across the country and watch the show with their sisters or their cousins or whoever it was that we made a show that I feel so proud of that I hold my head high that lasted for 10 years, actually 12 years. They stretched out our 10 seasons. So, you know, and it still makes an impact. It still runs in countries and you can get it on Amazon Prime and all of that is wonderful. What we did at that time, starting in 2002, was revolutionary. But it is also very hard that the show ended 10 years ago, and I am truly only ever associated with that show. And Mm -hmm. granted, I've only been working in the menopause space for about 18 months. I mean, that's when I took over um, State of Menopause. But it's a little bit frustrating when I feel not that fashion doesn't matter. Style matters so much to me. In fact, I'm ready to bring style to menopause, but it's that I wanted to move forward. I've evolved and Mm -hmm. it's not just about clothing for me anymore. Of course, clothing, what not to wear was never about clothing. Mm -hmm. No, it was about confidence and and feeling empowered. Yes. And self-esteem. And I personally encountered such a crisis of confidence during menopause and It really affected me enough to think about, well, what are we doing for people who may be experiencing this? Because I can't be the only one. And as it turns out, by 2025, there'll be a billion of us. (laughs) You you should not feel isolated and you should not feel alone. And if you are having a crisis of confidence, it actually is quite complicated with menopause. Mm -hmm. Menopause affects us physically and emotionally and spiritually, and nobody has ever really sat me down to talk about it. And I know, Normie, no, we were totally alone as individuals, very much alone. I think, I mean, I don't know about you, but I was also very much alone when I got my period for the first time. No one sat me down and told me about that. I'm also older than you. So it's still like a little bit of a, you know, kind of a generational gap where it was really a no-no to discuss it. Yeah. Well, everything about female women's bodies is a no, no, is Mm -hmm. a no, no. And -hmm. those who don't identify as either gender, right. I mean, that's even more marginalized and Mm -hmm. we need to start thinking about people who are experiencing menopause because there are lots of people with female reproductive organs who do not identify as women. And I think we need to start making room for that conversation as well as all of the other very prickly systemic issues that come up when you start talking about women's health. Even if you're talking about gendered binary health, the minute you start talking about that, I mean, first, most of the time, we're talking about white women. We are not looking at women of color with the same kind of care and concern. We are not looking at the chronically ill with the same kind of concern or how menopause affects them as well as us, right? This is a human issue. 52% of the population will go through some version of it, but 100% of us will be impacted by that. Right. And it's not like I don't want people to wear what looks great on them. It's not that I don't want to be able to actually help usher in a new style evolution for you as you reach midlife and as you deal with menopause. In fact, that's sort of the next 2.0 version of this for me. But it really was based on my own experience of feeling so alone and feeling so really truly beaten down by something I didn't understand. Right. Talk to us a little bit. I mean, you know, Stacey, we did choose this day to have this episode, to have this yes. conversation about menopause because it's going to be aired during World Menopause Month, which is October, and very close to World Menopause Day, which is October 18th, where we really want the whole world to band together and really celebrate women and really focus on women's health and certainly specifically menopause. But before we take the deep dive into menopause and all things menopause, the company that you run to help women navigate menopause and the event that you are hosting on October Mm -hmm. 18th, talk a bit. Now, Please start up again. Talk a bit about what your own personal menopause journey 
was like? What was it like? Yeah. I mean, my personal menopause journey was not, I didn't know it was menopause. Mm -hmm. Nobody mentioned it to me. I really did think it was an optional thing. <laughs> and the only version or the only reference that I really had to it was Edith Bunker when I was a little kid. I thought she was 100. I didn't know how old she was. <laughs> she was 48 when she started that show. I mean, I'm 53. I, like the idea that Edith Bunker was younger than me when she was talking about menopause is like, it blows my mind, right? Mind blowing. And, you know, I know Suzanne Summers tried to talk about it and didn't get as far as we've gotten now, but I really do appreciate everything that she brought to the table. But look, for somebody who has been in the public eye for a long time and, and was much more in the public eye than I am now, to have this kind of crisis of confidence after spending years trying to build other people's confidence really took me out of the game. Not only did I start to notice around 47 that... Like I was not feeling like myself. I mm -hmm. had spine surgery and I remember thinking it was pretty extensive spine surgery. I have a lot of titanium in my spine. And about six weeks after I saw the x-ray for the first time after what was a seven and a half hour surgery, I remember being so distraught and so anxious that I had all of this foreign material in my body. And that feeling grew to the point where... I was crying at dog food commercials. I was, you know, like anxious all the time. I was almost agoraphobic. I didn't want to go outside. I've always been, believe it or not, an introvert. And I have a lot of social anxiety. And it went off the charts. I mean, leaving home to go anywhere or be with people felt really hard. And at the same time, my phone stopped ringing and I wasn't getting as many calls. Nobody was asking me to audition for a new show. And I didn't really know what to do because I knew fashion makeover shows were not really in fashion anymore on television, right? That, that wasn't like the style. It's been competition shows. It's been Real Housewives. It's not what, what Not to Wear was. And mm -hmm. you do have Queer Eye on Netflix, but even that is a kind of a different version of a makeover show. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know where to go and I didn't know what to do. And while I was having this sense that I was sort of being left behind culturally, yes. I felt more and more insecure because I, that sort of feeling was being reinforced physically and emotionally with hormonal chaos, right? So I was like, oh but my God. you didn't I know. You didn't no. realize that this was all happening. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought it was the spine surgery, and then right. that took 18 months to recover from. And wow. during that time, I was experiencing night sweats, insomnia, hot flashes, anxiety. My skin got really dry. And that was the beginning of perimenopause, but I didn't know that. I just assumed like all these things were happening because I was aging, right? Not, not exactly. Menopause yep. was really, you know, gets conflated with aging, but obviously it's not the same thing. And by the fact that I was being sort of, you know, passed over in terms of my career. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, this one-two punch of both what was happening to me physiologically and what was happening to me culturally. And then my dad got very sick, right? And I've told this story many times that the spine surgery and the, my father's death were sort of the tent poles that amplified and held up my entire perimenopause experience. And when he got sick, he had a heart disease. I started to get heart palpitations. And he would get a rash and I would get a rash. And he would have muscle pain and I would have muscle pain. And I felt like I was mimicking him, him yes. out of fear. I had no idea that food allergies, skin rashes, and heart palpitations were symptoms of menopause. Right, that there's right. so many that, yeah, you know. At least uh, 34, 35 that we know of. That we know mm -hmm. of. Some doctors are saying they're closer to 100. Yeah. And that we don't actually identify them as part of the hormonal chaos of menopause because we're so concerned, you know, we're much more focused on aging. Exactly. And because there just isn't enough clinical data around female physiology. So, I mean, I've got to say, the more that I understood what was happening to me, the more, the more angry you got, resources I hope. resources that I found lacking, the yes. more angry, exactly. I got. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I really have a choice to make, right? I was already a beta tester for State Of when I started to learn more about menopause. I thought, I want to get involved. These friends of mine were starting this company, or they, it was a bigger brand called ARFA. 
and State of Menopause was one of the brands that they were creating. And I, I was a noisy beta tester. I had something to say about all of the products. And I remember thinking when they decided they weren't going to launch, they were going to shutter the brand and really pivot towards technology. I was like, I can't let that happen. Mm -hmm. There aren't enough over-the-counter, easily accessible, affordable brands that are making products to actually deal with issues in menopause. Now, of course, right, to make I women feel better, make every product, right? Where that, that is almost cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed in the last few years is how many companies are actually starting to work on the menopause vertical, which I oh, think my is- Oh my goodness. It's, there have been a slew of companies, femtech slew companies, mm -hmm, companies coming out with products that you can get over the counter, a lot more research being done. I mean, and that really is due to people like you and your colleagues who were starting these other companies, yeah. getting into this field and really pushing the conversation further. Yeah. But I, I mean, it's, it's I wanna, not before just we get into it. your company, because I, you know, I want everyone to know everything about your company and really why you decide, as you started to say, why you decided to take it over and run with it. I really want to know what do you think the reasons are that menopause is still taboo and is still considered something that shouldn't be discussed and should be swept under the rug. What yeah. do you think? I mean, you mentioned one of them. I think the biggest reason is because people associate it with aging. And yes, who the hell course. wants to talk about aging? Well, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of things though that I want to say. I don't think mm -hmm. that it's just my voices or the voices of other companies that are really going to change the narrative, right? I mean, we want you to know that there are products available for you that really run the gamut. When we talk about the white space, when we're discussing the business of the business of menopause, mm -hmm. I just want to be clear that the consumer needs to be educated either by, you know, figuring this out on her own or with her doctor or care provider. And look, to figure it out on your own, we are trying to make that education easy and centralized in one place that you will be able to go to State of Menopause and read about every aspect of menopause, not just products that we sell. Because really, you need to know that that spectrum runs from what I would call menopausal beauty, which is very different from function, functional products that are specific to symptoms, to hormones, which are medical treatment right? And there's, so there are, you have a lot of choices. So one of the things that I just wanted to say when we were talking about like loud voices, loud voices, yes, we get some attention, but the real onus is going to be on making sure that we can educate people in layman's terms and so that they are understanding way ahead of time what menopause is. I mean, I was talking about this with a friend this morning. We were saying when you get your period, you, that's your menopause origin story. My friend Oma Bernie Scott said this. And I was like, oh my God, if somebody had said to me, the minute that I got my period, now I'm going to tell you, here's where it starts, but eventually it ends, right? Here's what you've got to look forward to for the next 40 or 50 years. And then here's where it ends. That's and the exact you know, timeline what? that should be taught to young girls when they absolutely write. Exactly. So why aren't we doing that? Why, is, don't why is it taking our generation to talk about this? I have to ask you a question. Did you happen to see the article that was written by, I'm sorry, I don't recall her name. It's making the rounds this week. And it just was published in the Washington Post. But I thought it was really very spot on. The writer, she's a science and health writer. She talked about how, yes, all of these loud voices are now in this space. Mm. Naomi Watts just entered, mm -hmm. as we know. A lot of celebrities are going in there. You're in there. A lot of companies, as we just mentioned, are starting up and have products you know, across the whole spectrum, addressing mm -hmm. symptoms across the spectrum. But then she's saying, okay, that's all really great. And that's wonderful that we have these voices that are talking about it. But let's do exactly what you were just saying, Stacey. Let's get down to the real nitty gritty and right. really educate, educate women throughout their lifespan, mm -hmm. not just women who are there, mm -hmm. but who are years away from being there. Because it is people. going, as you said earlier too, it's 100% sure yeah. that you will have, you know, menopause, you will journey through menopause. Yes. But I will say that menopause is not even one size fits all. It's not one size fits most. Definitely not. Right? Mine and was pretty easy. 
But this is what I'm saying is that there isn't enough clinical research and data to really be able to say much more than, hey, menopause is this collection of issues. Here's what's going on when all of your hormones are decreasing or in flux. There's a lot to understand about why we can't be specific about when you're going to get menopause or how severe it will be for you or what symptoms you may experience. There's a lot that we can only generalize. But just to go back to your point, because I do think this is very important, myself included, I do not matter in this conversation unless all that I'm doing is really with a megaphone that is to educate other people. This idea that celebrities are now entering this market, we have to be careful of that, myself included, right? You want prominent people with a you know social media following, with some sort of right, like, with a platform. You know, potential for attention to be talking about these things, but it is not another industry for celebrities to profit off of. This is far more serious than, you know, a new lipstick. This is far more serious than just eyeshadow. What we are talking about in menopause and the kinds of products that should be available to you have to have true value. This is not about snake oil bullshit. And it's some of the reason that there's not everything in this, in, you know, what is being offered in the menopause market that really I can get behind because I don't believe that we can do everything for everyone. Not every company can. And we also have to know what part of that white space we're playing in so that we're not making promises that we can't keep to women, that we're not confusing people in general, and that we're really allowing people to have agency over this myriad of choices. You get fatigued with decisions if you don't understand why you're even making them in the first place. So there's so much more education, even before the discussion of product, even before the discussion of commerce. This is about bodily acceptance. This is about aging and acceptance. There's so much that we have to move the needle on in terms of our cultural understanding of aging, particularly if we're being very binary, how it, it is expressed towards women, right? Ageism is in fact sexism. Oh, it is indeed. We're talking about a marginalized topic like menopause. Then it's like, ew, Oh, it's so icky, right? Everything that happens to female physiology, we somehow, through a patriarchal lens, make icky. Your period is gross. Nobody wants to have sex on their period. I'm like, well, why is it gross? We wouldn't have babies without that. So why is that gross? Why do we say to women who experience postpartum or to people who experience postpartum, sometimes depression, something's wrong with that? Like if you're not beatific, when you're pregnant with child, there is something wrong, wrong. with you. Mm -hmm. When we talk about infertility, we use words like success and performance and failure. How are we supposed to be allies to our own bodies when we're made to feel that they're awful and from the start, that something is wrong with them from the start? So there's so much work to do in the way that we think about this, right? Now, part of this is sociobiological. We still have ancient software, right? This is the same fight, flight, or freeze brain that cavemen had with woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. I say this all the time. But <laughs> yes, what's changed it's true. is that we're, we're no longer being faced with those ancient animals. We are being faced with different kinds of choices. There is a reason that we prize youth above everything in our society. That is basically sociobiologic. Youth is fertile, right? Youth is fertility. And so we look at menopause as this expiration date and in, in the biological use value of female physiology. That's just innate. That's part of our sort of, I don't know, it's just part of our wiring. And I don't know that we can get away from that unless we're separating biology from culture and society, right? And you can look at women well past, you know, the point of giving a biological birth. And it's not like they're not contributing to society. I mean, we are really lucky to have women over a certain age who are still, you know, fighting the good fight. Fighting the good fight and very active, which brings me to a question. Yeah. What are your thoughts on how menopause should be treated in the workplace? There are some very vocal thought leaders I've talked to, quite a few, who believe that it's imperative that companies mm -hmm. support women throughout the menopause journey, of course, right? Not your While question. others, very interesting, think, nope, it will be just another ism that will be placed on women to hold them back, like sexism, like yeah. 
ageism. So what is it? Menopauseism? Just another right, exactly. thing? Just that another go, thing. Oh, well, you know, you're in menopause, your hot flashes, you're moody, whatever your symptoms are, you can't function as the CEO or the VP of sales or fill in the blank. Right, Barbara. That's why right. you've you're read all the studies, right. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, How many studies, women are leaving the workplace because they're not supported? Yes. One in 10 women are leaving. And I, I say that with real reservation because I do believe like almost everything else that women and those who identify as women have had to fight for is that it is used against us. Yes. So instead of saying one out of 10 women are leaving the workplace because they are not being supported by their employer to go through menopause with some sort of, you know, either paid leave or cooling room or day off or whatever that looks like is really basically just saying, well, then we're not going to hire you or we're going to fire you, right? It's not going to make the onus. I mean, look how long it's taken for diversity and inclusion to be part of an actual uh, officer and an actual working role in most companies to happen. Correct. How long has that taken us? So when, you know, we talk One thing, about- Sorry, I want to just point something out. I had a guest on the show last month. We were talking about this exact thing, not relation to menopause, but just about aging. And inclusion, director of inclusion, whatever the title is, rarely, I shouldn't say never, rarely does that include aging. It never does. And almost the, never. Right, almost I don't want to say never, never, but right. almost never. It's everything else that you could think of, but it's yeah. not- aging, which, and I think we could connect that to met back to menopause. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, well, certainly I think for those who present as female, yes, I think menopause is just another, it's another prejudice that we can have. It's another prejudice. Exactly women, right? right. And so I want to be very careful about how we use that information, especially when we are, a lot of us are being forced back to the office and by far women were much more comfortable working remotely you know, as multitaskers, many women felt they could spend more time with their kids and get more of their work done. And they felt much more productive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now you've got people saying, Hey, it's time to go back to the office. You don't have a choice. When we are saying one out of 10 women can't function at the workplace without help or support because of menopause, we're basically just saying you're not going to hire us. So those are very, very difficult problems for us to discuss with the patriarchal lens we still have on work, on the way we work, and how we, what's the word I'm looking for, how we can maybe re-shift our perspective a little bit about aging instead mm -hmm. of dismissing- A, a different aging. lens. Uh, yes. How do we learn to revere experience simply by having more days on the planet, right? There's mm -hmm. always a younger generation that poo-poos the older generation because we didn't take things far enough. They take things farther. They advance. Every generation advances our society more. It continues to change. We are constantly evolving. So the idea that Gen X is basically, I think, the generation that is going to end this kind of generational shame and- I really hope so. Right, around menopause. I think that we are also learning from younger generations who are so much more open about, you know, the systemic breakdown of race, of gender, of sexuality, so that we're going to come and meet in the middle. Younger people are not afraid to understand this physiology. And it's not, you know, I remember a millennial kind of slapped back at me on, um, on Instagram saying that I was using scare tactics to talk about menopause. And I was like, oh, I wish, I wish you would. <laughs> I know, we, I we, like, we wish. I am using prepare tactics because the more you know, the more you know. And then when you start to feel weird, whether it's surgical or medical menopause, if it's gender non-binary menopause, if you're coming to this chronologically and you start to notice, wow, I don't look like myself. I don't feel like myself. You can start to track some of these things. What are you feeling? What are you feeling emotionally? What are you feeling physically? Is your fuse really short? Do you feel annoyed? All of these things are related to hormonal fluctuation. And if you have an idea that that's what's starting to happen, hey, you can go to your care practitioner, you can go to your doctor, you can go to your best friend, you can go to your significant other, you can even go to your children, your parents and say, I'm going to need some support here. 
Yeah. And if we start with that, then maybe then we can also say to our employers, hey, this is just like a lactation room, right? We yeah. need extra This is what we need. Stuff you know, know what? Our best I always do. Help. Yeah. I always do feel that I don't want people to, to think that I think or that we're saying right now that the onus is on women. Of but, course not. But unfortunately, but unfortunately, I, <laughs> I really do happened. think that it does have to start with us that banding together and feeling comfortable in our own skins, sharing everything that we know as you are now doing, as I am doing to the best of my ability with other women. And that is what is going to empower women to move forward with this and to feel comfortable talking about it. One thing I want to ask you, I, you know, I'm pretty plugged in, I think, with the menopause, you know, industry and other websites. And I see a lot more progress being made in the UK than here. No question. No question. No question. I see a lot more support groups and websites. I don't know about companies with products so much, but with all of the support in place, it's much greater in the UK. And they also teach it as part of their curriculum in school. Did you know that? Yes. As of like about two years ago, it's fairly new. And I'm seeing a lot of activity in the workplace now. I get a lot of email reports from the UK about all these companies that are creating like kind of like a diversity, you know, mm-hmm. director, but focusing on menopause support. We're not well, seeing there's a that here. Reasons for that, Barbara. We're not seeing that here because we're much more of a capitalist society. If I'm really being honest, economy plays into this a huge amount. Absolutely right. And also the way that we perceive beauty in America is very different from the UK. It is a much smaller country. You know, Davina McCall has been an incredible mm-hmm. spokesperson, very outspoken about menopause. You've had male support from people like Rod Stewart talking about his mm-hmm. wife. These are things that we haven't seen happen here yet. And it is much easier to affect change in a smaller country than it is with 330 million people living here. I mean, our government right now is kind of a shit show. And so the idea that we're going to be able to move legislation around women's health is not going to be that easy. No. And that's not to say everything is um, honky-dory and and rose-colored, you know, glasses in the UK. No, they have their issues right now, too. But with regards to this, I think that they are making more progress than we are. No question. And that was a really good explanation. I'm I'm glad that you pointed all of that out. Thank you for that. Listen, after this short break, uh, sorry. I apologize. I was just going to say, not even English, just in the UK, I really do believe that aging is actually regarded very differently. It's an older country. You know, we are a very young country and a lot of our values are based on this idea of capitalism and, and what it means to be of value, right? Mm -hmm. We prize beauty and youth and wealth above almost anything else in this country. Mm -hmm. We do not prioritize health, not health of our communities, not health of our population. It is a very individualistic, very selfish society. Mm -hmm. You know, I entered this space of positive aging about 15 years ago when my first book Mm -hmm. came out. And I have to say, at that time, I was a lone voice in the wilderness. No one was talking about menopause. I wasn't talking about menopause specifically at that time. It was more about positive and healthy aging. And the buzzword that was still being used for the most part was anti-aging. Like everything was anti- like, don't age. You don't want to age. It's a disease. Don't do it. Here's what you can do to anti-age. And then we all know, as the years went on, then Michelle Lee, who was then the editor of Allure magazine banned the term anti-aging from the pages of Allure. This was maybe about five years ago or so. And uh, many, many other publications followed suit. And now it's become like the thing to do is to not use the word anti-aging. So the point is in 15 years, there has been a lot of positive change in the right direction about aging. However, oh my goodness, not a sea change and certainly not a nearly enough Yeah. No, Barbara, I was going to say, and there's a lot that's performative. And to be fair, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here at all. I do think you're right. I think there has definitely been a shift in the last 15 years in the way that we're talking about aging, also because Gen X in particular does not want to age, right? (laughs) And we're probably the generation that really grew up with Botox and fillers, you know, being used every day. 
So I laugh sometimes when I think about the fact that most women in their 50s think that they look great for their age. And I'm like, yeah, with some help, like no judgment. (laughs) No judgment. Definitely not. Never. You're still trying to avoid aging. That's not the same thing as saying we are wholeheartedly accepting ourselves, right? Maybe this makes the the aging process, it it makes it a little bit softer for us to know that we've got, you know, filters on Instagram and fillers and Botox. Maybe that makes it easier. But the fact is, and we may look better for our age than generations before us, but that still doesn't really get over the fact that by altering ourselves or by not being comfortable with aging, that we're still making aging this taboo thing, Mm -hmm. right? And it's so fascinating because I want women to do whatever makes them feel good. I want women to be in control of their physiology, of their emotional life. I want you to control the narrative of everything that you do. But what underlies a lot of that when we say, you know, your choice is yours, is that by saying, look, we have all these cosmetic procedures, you don't have to age at the same rate that you would have 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We're still saying we're anti-aging, mm-hmm. you know. We're, we're still even though we're not saying way. those words, That's we're right. living. We're living so, that reality. So I agree it, it with you on that. Performative, yeah. yeah, and that is dangerous in its own way. Look, mm-hmm. fifteen years, you know, in the scheme of things, is a blip. It's nothing. It's a blink. Mm-hmm. This is the kind of work. Look how much we are still fighting for women's and female equality. You know, just gender equality mm-hmm. and equity. And equity. I mean, we're still making that 73 cents to every dollar. I mean, you know, it's shocking, mind blowing. It is the kind of thing that you could on any given day, take that proverbial blanket and put it over your head and stay there forever, which is, uh, but we we don't want to do that, right? You and I have way too much to do. After this short break, we'll continue this chat about menopause. And Stacy is going to tell us about her company and the event she's hosting to celebrate World Menopause Day. Stay tuned. Okay, we're back with my guest, Stacey London. All right, Stacey, you know, I publish a newsletter in partnership with an, a reproductive endocrinologist from NYU Lancome Health. It's called Menopause Cheat Sheet. And while we, of course, focus on all the symptoms of menopause, sure, hot flashes and, you know, what I like to call the terrible trifecta, hot flashes, mood swings, sleepless nights, which yeah. are the most common. Our biggest concern really is not so much that, although we do focus on it, but the deeper, more chronic, more long-term changes that happen to a woman's body as estrogen levels drop and she journeys through menopause and comes out on the other side and becomes forevermore a post-menopausal, post-menopausal woman for the rest of your life, right? Which is what I am. And that's a great concern to me because as you mentioned earlier in our conversation, you didn't know what was going on when you were having all of these mm-hmm. symptoms. Like what in the world was going on? Well, do you think for a minute that you were thinking about your bones? No. Were you thinking about your heart? Or well, you you had some heart palpitations. As you, but were you thinking about your brain health? No, because not only are we not thinking about, you know, what is going on during paramedic, like what's happening to me? I guess I'm just getting old. But you are really, women are not focusing on their their bones are getting weaker and thinner. And that is our greatest mission with this newsletter and with everything we do connected to menopause is to make sure that women do everything they can as early as possible to mitigate some of the this impact. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, that's exactly what you have to do. It is the fact that menopause is not a vanity issue. And while there may be things that you want to change, like your skin gets really dry or you're getting cystic acne or pre-rosacea or your hair is breaking or falling out. dry eyes like me. Dry eyes, dry mouth, dry vagina, dry, dry. We get, you know, all of the things and the mood swings and the night flash, the night sweats and the hot flashes and the insomnia, enough of those symptoms strung together, you know, makes a pretty good necklace of crazy. (laughs) <laughs> and this is what I'm saying is like, there is a deep psychological impact to things that may feel like vanity, but then 
we have to look at not only the psychological impact of a string of things like sleepless nights or weight gain or weight, you know, body weight redistribution, all of these things that make Mm -hmm. us feel unlike ourselves, which is scary. This is a question of identity and loss of identity is very scary. And it is a crisis of confidence that I don't want to minimize because that's not just about like, I don't look young anymore. It really is very weird when you look in the mirror and you're like, I don't know who I'm seeing. That is very disconcerting. Mm -hmm. So there's that. But then to your point, underneath, like whether we're talking about vanity or psychological or an, an emotional impact is the true health issues that if we have knowledge, we have so many preventative tools to mitigate the issues. So, you know, you were talking about bone health. I was just diagnosed with osteopenia. I now have to drink liquid calcium every day, not milk, liquid calcium. Wow. And the fact okay. is I should have been doing strength training for the last 20 years straight. And I've only done it on and off. But if I'd known that strength training was actually going to keep my muscle mass and protect my bones, then I would have done that. Did I know that cognitive decrease happens after menopause? I mean, Dr. Lisa Moscone has written so much about She's the brain amazing. and menopause. Mm-hmm. Totally amazing. The great thing is, is that for most people, even though there can be amyloid plaques that develop on the brain, it is not a marker of early dementia or Alzheimer's. It it is an indicator that like we have to pay attention to, but the fact is it doesn't, it's not a marker. It doesn't prove that you will get either of those things. But what she does say is that after post-menopause, most women's brains just go back to being as they were. So that idea of brain fog or not being able to remember a word or not knowing why you walked into a room actually winds up improving post-menopause. But what is important is neuroplasticity, creating new pathways for the brain, new ways of thinking, always learning, whether you're playing brain games on your phone or you're reading or you're learning how to do something new. The more you do that in your life as you age, the better your aging experience is going to be. We know that that's science. I mean, that's you mentioned something before relative to bone health about strength training and you wish that you had been doing it for, and I hope that you're doing it now or that you will be because that's super duper important. I'm on the board of the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation have been for almost nine years Mm. and I joined and I'm very actively involved in the very loud voice for bone health because I fell right after menopause when I was at 50 and broke Mm. my arm and I shouldn't have. Mm, And that's when I got my first bone density test. And so I too had osteopenia. The good news for me, 15 years later, by sticking with my plan, eating calcium rich foods, strength training, and I'm a runner, I started running and I'm actually training for my 15th marathon, the New York City Marathon coming up (laughs) in a couple of weeks. (laughs) I'm still osteopenia. That's the point is that I didn't reverse it, but it didn't progress to osteoporosis. And quite frankly, had I not taken all of these steps, I probably would right now have osteoporosis. I'm not saying I definitely would, but the chance was very, very good. So you can do the same. You have osteopenia, but you keep doing what you're doing. And it's also genetic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, my mom has osteopenia, which she was diagnosed with after menopause, Mm -hmm. and it never progressed you know, partially, I think because she did take some steps, maybe not as radical the steps that I'm going to take, but it is possible to- That's a generational thing. Right. And also, and not have it progress. But the thing is osteoporosis, like we don't even talk about what a horrible disease that is. No. And and the costs involved and how my mother fell and broke her hip four years ago. She was independent and mobile. Mm. She had surgery. Of course, she fractured her hip. She was confined to a wheelchair and she passed away last year. That is definitely not a path to aging better. No, it is not. Or healthy aging. And and on on top of that. The fate that everybody should avoid. So, but but I bring up strength training. I wanted to just get back to the brain because you were making some excellent points there. So I want to kind of veer you back. Is strength training, as it turns out, based on all the newest research is one of the best ways to keep that brain, the plasticity going. Mm-hmm. Did you mm-hmm. know that? Strength training. Well, all specifically. Exercise. I mean, also, of course, cardio, that's another reason yeah. I run. But strength training just has this incredible ability to keep your brain strong. It's amazing. I think all roads lead to fitness, so. 
Yeah, well, I, I don't disagree with you, but also part of it is that strength training requires coordination, mm-hmm. right? You're not just strength training. This is balance and it's endurance. And all of those things require you to use both sides of your brain. Yes. And that's why when you do things that are in parallel, it's not like you're only lifting weights on one arm. You have to do both specifically, not only to keep yourself, you know, it, symmetry is part of our body. It actually forces your brain to work both sides. Both sides of the brain need to work in order for you to be able to move both of your arms or both of your legs or do this at the same time. So all of that really does play into, I don't disagree with you, Barbara. I really do think that all roads do lead to fitness and nutrition and sleep hygiene. Those are the 10. Oh yeah, those three. But if we're not looking at also things as kind of complicated and murky as childhood trauma, that can actually affect your menopause experience. So there are so many things. It's such a nebulous, you know, kind of topic that we're trying to grab hold of. Even 15 years ago when you started this, right, and you were sort of the lone voice in this category, we're still, we still don't have the handle on it, right, that we need. We just, we're getting there. It's almost like we're climbing the mountain rung or, you know, the wall or the ladder, whatever, rung by rung. And eventually we will get to the summit. Yeah. You know, menopause is, I like to say it is universal, as we've said many times, like it's 100% sure, right, that you will experience it. It's universal, but very, very personal because we're all different human beings. And so that's where personalized medicine and personalized treatment comes into play. That's a super, I, like the, my partner yeah. in, the, in the newsletter, Dr. Marco Noctegal, that she talks about this constantly, that you need to have a partner. And th- this is something else I want to talk about too. We know that people don't want to talk about menopause. They're starting to talk about menopause. This is really good. I think we're heading in the right direction. But we also know that there are so many healthcare providers who have, God, it seems like less than zero understanding of menopause or women's bodies in general. And this is a real travesty. Yes. One in four doctors do not feel comfortable explaining or discussing menopause with their patients. Mm -hmm. And that is a very big problem. It's a huge problem. It is a bigger problem when we think about the fact that there are a lot of people who don't even get to see doctors, who don't have insurance and have no one to talk to. And there is no one trusted source of information where you can really understand what's happening to you if you don't have the luxury of being able to go to your doctor. And if you do have the luxury of being able to go to your doctor, you may only have like 12 minutes with them. So, you know, a lot of things that we have to do are about, um, there was a study done and I'm sorry, I can't cite where it is from, but it was that a hundred out of like a hundred women asked, 20% of them felt comfortable discussing menopause. Forget about doctors for a second, just women felt uncomfortable discussing menopause. But of those 20, 100% of them wanted to talk to friends. Mm -hmm. They wanted to talk to friends in a way that they felt somebody they could trust, somebody they can share what they may be ashamed of with, who isn't judging them, who loves them unconditionally. This is not a doctor, right? This is like your best friend. And you may not feel comfortable talking about this with your significant other because intimacy and issues of painful sex and loss of libido can be very hard to have. Very hard to talk about. Between 45 and 55 is the highest rate of decreased earning potential in a woman's life, highest rate of divorce and highest rate of depression. And I don't think those things are by accident. I think what we are coming to at this stage of life is a tsunami of issues Mm -hmm. that are both biological, physiological, and cultural. And that is a lot for us to take on. The and so storm. it is incredibly important that we start to have these support systems. You never have to see a medical doctor in menopause if you don't want to. There are plenty of practices that are about integrative medicine that don't require, look, I couldn't take hormones. I have autoimmune diseases and I have a history of a heart attack and stroke in my family. I was absolutely forbidden to take hormones. Part of the reason that, you know, this was such a hard journey for me is that maybe it would have been better if I could have had an estrogen patch. Maybe it wouldn't have felt so extreme and awful. But there are a lot of people like me who can't take hormones, don't want to take hormones, cannot afford hormones. 
where and how are we educating them? And then what product are we making available? Because frankly, just like the period tax, I'm starting to feel like menopause products are essential and we should be giving them away. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and you said something very important, right? Like this experience is universal and personal. And my argument would be that from the personal can come the universal. It's exactly the theory I had on what not to wear. You didn't have to be the person on the show to get information about how to shop for yourself. You could have that person's body type and be like, oh, that one looks like me. I know exactly. I'm going to take those tips and go. That's right. Or those tips would be not for you and you would know what to do instead, you know, you would know what not to shop for, right? So for me, it is very important that we talk about our personal experiences, that we share those personal experiences because that's where our universal language is going to come from. It is going to come from being around people who are empathetic, who understand the language that you are speaking when you are talking about menopause. That's essential. It is essential for us. And frankly, the advances that are going to be made in medicine, really in medical care around menopause are really going to be significant. And you hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned. We are becoming a more and more personalized kind of healthcare. Now that is still something that is reserved, I think, for the wealthy mm -hmm. and the fortunate. Mm -hmm. And we are mm -hmm. going to have to figure out how to make that a little bit more egalitarian. But you're going to have personalized nutrition, really yeah, everything. We, your blood tests are going to, uh, you know, companies will start making uh, vitamin compounds that are specifically for Barbara Grufferman. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like that to me is fascinating. I had a guest on recently who is an expert, just a an amazingly brilliant young man, a young scientist, an expert on the gut microbiome. And we were yeah. talking exactly of this, that this is the future. I mean, the microbiome yeah. is, they call it the second brain. It controls yeah. so much of what's happening. It's also very connected to menopause and the symptoms that you have. And he sees the future being exactly that, that you'll yeah. send it in. And there are companies right now that are available. I had actually listed them in the show notes of that episode but he said, you know, I don't want to say you're wasting your money at this time, but they're not really ready for showtime just yet. But that Some is the future. Are, but they are exorbitantly expensive. Expand, like, right? yes. We're not there yet. We're not for, there yet. But that is the future. For the masses, right? We're not there yet for us. Correct. But it is coming and it is going to change the way you're even going to buy you know, vitamins or supplements or anything at a store, you're going to be able to put all of that information into an app and it's going to arrive at your doorstep and you're never going to have to think twice about it. Yeah, it's And great. that is going to include menopause. And that is going to include the kinds of symptoms or the severity of the symptoms that you're experiencing. We're not there yet. We may not be there in our lifetimes. I don't know. Hey, Stacey, tell us about your company now. I really want everyone to know about your company and sure. how this even happened. Because I know you didn't actually start the company. You took I did not. over I was the a company. Beta tester when it yes. Started. So to talk to us about that. And and you're creating this community of women also. Mm. Getting back to what you've been saying about how we need to learn from each other. We need to feel, you know, in a safe place to talk about mm. these very personal, intimate things like sex you know, vaginal dryness and whatever it is that's bothering us that we don't want to discuss with a lot of other people. So talk to us about your company. What, what is really the mission? I know you, of course, you have wonderful products and there's one in particular I want you to focus on, the one yeah. that's on CBD. But anyway, tell us about your company okay. and, and I'll ask okay. you about that. Well, <laughs> I was a beta tester and I was a beta tester as I was actually starting to realize that I was in menopause. Yes. So this was in 2019. And I, I actually was like, oh my God, you know, friends of mine started this company. They asked me if I would get involved. I was so excited. I loved being a beta tester. I was very noisy. I had issues with everything. Unfortunately, some stuff was not run by me. I didn't get the full gamut, but I got enough. And when they decided that they did not want to be in consumer products, I was like, oh, wait, wait, hold on. And a good friend was like, hey, I think this might be something you should think about taking over. And in a lot of ways, I wish I'd known a lot more before I said yes. And I've learned a lot of very hard lessons. <laughs> on the job. <laughs> on the job. But sort of the only way to do it, yeah. right, is, you know, you just got to learn fire. by doing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Jump in. And for me, this also gave me a lot of purpose. For somebody who sort of didn't know what to do career-wise, didn't know where to go, 
didn't want to be dressing private clients, didn't want to be doing any of that stuff. I thought, here is my purpose. Here is something that feels like in midlife, I can pivot into another kind of purpose. Well, actually, it's not even another kind of purpose, right? What is the through line of my entire career Mm -hmm. has been to be a self-esteemist, has been to be about raising your confidence. I did it with fashion, but now it is time to do it with the, an extension of what self-care looks like, right? Style is a version of self-care. This is a version of self-care. And this transition, this absolutely natural transition and evolution that menopause is, can be a crisis of confidence. And that is fixable. That is something I can do. And so when this company was like, mm, nope, I think we're going to step away from consumer products. I was like, no, no. I think it's short-sighted to think of it as, you know, any kind of like skincare. We need to go much deeper than that. But Mm -hmm. I saw the potential where they started. They started with great body creams, great face creams. We have a whole cooling section, cooling sprays, cooling gels, both to moisturize the skin and to prevent cystic acne, free rosacea, redness, things like that. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we have like an Arnica hand and joint cream. We have a CBD oil. Those things are for muscle fatigue, joint pain, Which breast Which are temp- real things. Another symptom that people don't really recognize. Exactly. We have to teach people what these symptoms are. Yep. So on the site, you can shop by symptom. And instead of being like, oh, I need cooling, I need hydration, I need this, which you might know. But if you don't, you can actually take our quiz on the site and it's a great recognize site. whether or not you're in menopause, one. Two, all the articles you can read about it are on our blog. And three, then you can say, oh, dry hair and our whole new hair collection. I know. I saw you on Instagram, Stacey. You're really great. And and everyone should follow you on Instagram. We're going to have all those links in the show notes. Oh, of course, we'll have a link to the website and to your social media platforms. I mean, you're very entertaining. (laughs) I appreciate that because honestly, but you're also getting the word out. I started out. that 50% off sale, which by the way ends October 17th, but I did 50% off everything on the site, even our new hair care, because Mercury in retrograde has <laughs> just been such a nightmare. And I kind of feel like menopause is the Mercury in retrograde stage of life. I love it. I am trying to be funny, but there is some truth in it because if you ask any astrologer about Mercury in retrograde, right, they'll tell you yes. Your electronics are going to blow up. Your communication is going to be awful. You're going to fight with everybody you know. You know it, but what, it, what is <laughs> underneath all of that? What do they tell you? That it is the best time to sit back, to allow, to receive, to pause. That's what menopause is. It may feel like chaos. It may feel like this tsunami is happening to you. But if you can actually pull back a little bit and just quiet down a little bit, enough to hear your body, enough to hear what your thoughts are, then you can start to put things in a little bit of perspective. And that's what I didn't have. My brain was doing mental gymnastics to figure out what was wrong with me. And I didn't know that this was natural. Exactly. And maybe if I'd known that since the time I was 11 and the first time I got my period, I wouldn't have been so afraid. I wouldn't have been so insecure. I would have opened up more immediately and asked for help. And I wouldn't have let doctors dismiss my concerns. All of those things happened to me because I was completely uninformed about this stage of life. You and almost every other woman I've ever met, you know, you certainly are on alone with that, right? Exactly. As we know. And that needs to change. Mm -hmm. It needs to change. And if you and I and anybody else who is going to be in this vertical, that has to be our goal. I mean, I, look, I want everybody to have successful companies. Don't get me wrong. That's not my point. But my point is, it is much more important that we are working in concert to serve this community than for any one person to run away with like being the voice or the face or whatever it is of menopause, right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I've been saying this since I started the company or so since I So actually then tell us about the event that you're hosting on a World Menopause Day, which is yes. October 18th. And I'm yes. happy I'll be at this event listening I'm to so everyone excited. speak. But you pulled off an amazing feat, a really incredible thing where, well, tell us about it. You've gotten all these people together who are really competitive, but you're bringing them all together. Tell us. Well, I mean, 
I feel very lucky. I reached out to a number of CEOs who all run menopause companies. And again, just to reiterate, the menopause spectrum, everything from beauty to function to telehealth and hormones. Correct. And Mm -hmm. I reached out to people that I had never met and some people that I knew previously from other iterations of my life. But I said, some of us are actual competitors. Some of us have identical product lines. Some of us don't, right? But who cares? Because any person in menopause deserves choice. And just saying that there's one company that makes menopause products is never going to be enough. Saying there are 20 companies is never going to be enough. We are talking about 1 billion people, 12% of the Earth's population and the population of China in menopause in less than 36 months. How are we managing this? How are we moving the needle in culture? How are we making the press our allies? to get this message out, to talk about not just what, you know, oh, boo-hoo, we're getting old, anti-aging, you know, let's stop doing that, right? But to actually talk about the real health benefits of understanding menopause, the real opportunity of menopause, the real opportunities in midlife. Why can't we put that ahead of any competition in service of this community that needs all of us? So what do you hope to achieve on this day? Well, I got 17 CEOs to say yes, and I wish I could list them all for you, but it is Sally Mueller from uh, Woman S and Michelle Jacobs, her co-CEO, Rochelle Weitzner from Poswell Aging, Sonsalas Gonzalez from Better Not I've met many, many, many of these women so far, and they're all, they're just so impressive, and they all have wonderful, wonderful, you know, reasons for being in this space, and they oh. all have great goals and a lot of them have big hearts and, you know, but they also oh, they all have huge hearts. Yeah. yeah. And, but the we fact that they're Angelo. coming together is going well, to be, I cannot yeah. wait for this day. <laughs> well, we have Jill Angelo from Genev. We have yes. Debbie and Markia Dickinson from Thermaband. We have Michael Satel from Bonafide. We have uh, Alessandra Henderson from Electra Health. We have Anne Fullenwinder from My Alloy. We have Alicia Jackson from Evernow. I mean, I know I'm forgetting more people. We have Laura Crane from Hello Perry Mm -hmm. or Hey Perry, Mm -hmm. which is a community of 12,000 perimenopausal women. Mm -hmm. And again, bringing them all together, there are some of us that are all over-the-counter product. There are some of us that are telehealth. And again, like in any Mm -hmm. other situation, right, you might say, oh, we're just cannibalizing each other. But not when I am bringing together all of these people, not only to talk about why now, why your company right now and why now, how do we have conversations around legislation, around clinical education, around clinical research, around beauty and media and culture to make this not a punchline and not a running joke, but something that we are now integrating into all aspects of our lives, whether it is about a beauty product or it is about bone health. All of this should be something that is in our common vernacular. And what better way to do that than to take the brilliance of all of these CEOs, most of whom are Gen X, and say, how are we doing this? How are we doing this together? And how are we going to change it? And I couldn't believe everybody said yes, but I truly think that collaboration over competition isn't just the best formula to serve a community. It is the best formula to get the word out about menopause that much faster. Well done, Stacey. We really <laughs> just well it's done. Well, yeah, I, everybody's going to applaud yeah, so you. I got to give credit where credit is due. It's like when all I of saw, these ones. When I saw the list of people who were attending to speak and be on panels and whatever the, you know, it'll be, I was just incredibly blown away and impressed. Yes. We have Glenn Floyd from Wild Women. We have Colette Cortian from Joy Lux. I mean, it goes on and yeah, on. Yeah, it's going to be quite the and day. On. And it I know really uh, we'll learn a great deal. And I think that there'll be a lot of collaboration in the future. As a result, I'm sure that's one of your big goals, of course, is to kind it's of come up with absolutely. things that you can all, all to educate women and to have women feel empowered. I mean, that's really the bottom line, right? Absolutely. That's it, right there. Right. Nail on the head. Like education and empowerment. And feeling that sense of agency, that is what we need to give back to people who are experiencing menopause without knowing what is happening to them. 
Because once you know, then you can decipher your options and then you can choose what's going to be right for you. And whatever that is, whatever that looks like and whomever you want to talk to, you will not be going in blind. And the great thing is, look, this is also a completely freeing time if you are coming to this chronologically. Between 40 and 60 is such a transformative stage of life. Yeah. We do not treat it with the respect and the value that it deserves. And this is the beginning of that change. It really, really is. And you know what? I focus on also specifically women 55 to 65 too in some of the things I do for really more focused mm -hmm. on post-menopause life and aging better. And there is, according to so many medical experts, there is this window. It's like a window of opportunity to mm. really, you know, all the changes have taken place. You're post-menopausal at this point, And you really have a window of about 10 years to set yourself up to age really well so that you can be mm. mobile and independent and, you know, happy and as happy as you can be as you go on in life. And that's just true. It's like this wonderful window, 40 to 60, just, you know, grab it, everybody. Hold on yes, to that grab and it. do everything you can. This is your time, right? It really yeah. is. I hate to sound like but a I'll cliche, but the, your time, no, it sounds like it, it is. But it is. But it is. Right. It looks, but it's, it's time for you like to focus my... on yourself, right? Yes. I am 53 and my mom is about to be 81. And, you know, I lost my dad mm -hmm. and it is hard to be this age. It is hard to be this age for a lot of reasons. And I always mention the fancy agency, they came up with the term, the sandwich generation, right? Mm -hmm. That's where we are mm -hmm. at this stage. You may still be dealing with childcare or elder care or kids leaving home and your parents dying. What does that look like? What does that mean? What that means is A, you can feel very much alone and B, it and also reminds you that you're next right? I mean, this is staring mortality in the face in a way. And, you know, again, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer here, but what I am saying is it does pose an opportunity. And my trainer, now that I'm back to strength Yay. training, said to me, stop worrying about like what your body looks like or whether or not you've gained some weight or lost muscle. Stop worrying about that stuff. He was like, think about this as an investment in your future freedom. Mm -hmm. And it hit me so hard, I almost fell over. Mm -hmm. I do not want somebody to have to take care of me. I do not want to live in assisted living. I want to live out my days as independently as I can. And mobile yeah. and mobility is the only way that you get to keep that freedom. Think about it. The minute somebody is a fall risk, it's like the beginning of the end. It is. That's what we focus of at uh, Bone Health and Osteoporosis for Data. We focus on that yes. all the time. There's a mantra here that you want to stick in your head now that you're kind of into, you're, you're really in this game, Stacey, and I'm really, really happy about it. I'm never going to run a marathon, Barbara. I'm not going to lie to you. But, <laughs> Nobody you should know. have to. It's so crazy. Oh my God. It's so crazy. <laughs> it's like, you're, I don't know. It's so massive. crazy. It's so crazy. But this mantra is no falls, no fractures. Unless you have severe osteoporosis, severe osteoporosis, where if you sneeze, you know, you break something, you but that's like not really the reality of a lot of people. But if you fall and you're of like osteopenia, like you and I are, yeah. you could break something very easily. Easily. I got hugged too hard uh, last year and I broke a rib. <gasps> wow. Yeah. It's really very easy. And I have to say it's again, no falls, no fractures, future freedom. Yeah. Think we about like those the future Fs. of your freedom. <laughs> we like those Fs. Exactly. Alliteration. I love it. Yep. But it is one of those things where, you know, look, this is also what is scary about aging is like it is natural for your body to become more frail. Yeah. There is a, you know, a natural beginning and end to every process, right? Every physical process in the body. And this is not about like we're even seeing people talking more about death doulas, right? We, you know, we're seeing the rise in a birth doulas. Like we're seeing this idea of community and support around different transitions in our lives. Yes. And it is really important that we look at this as a meaningful transition. And it doesn't mean that we're kind of crossing over, like, you know, we're getting on the boat to Hades. Like, you know, <laughs> it's not one of those things. This is another place to change lanes, right? Yes. Well said. Another place to change lanes. And I also am a very big believer, as I'm sure you are, 
to reassess every couple of years, not Always. even like every 10 years, but every couple of years, because yeah. your body is in a constant state of change. So you may need to tweak. You like, and for example, you that. now need to eat more calcium or drink it, as, drink <laughs> as you told us. Do, do you know what I'm and saying? Also, and my style is totally different, let's say, than when I was 25, too, right? We all evolve. Yes. Our taste changes, our body changes. Remember, every seven years, every cell in your body has been regenerated. It's new. Mm -hmm. You are never going to be the same person. You are not static. You are constant. You are dynamic. And you are constantly evolving. And this kind of education, even though it feels like we're saying, oh, you know, watch out, all these things are going to happen. This is another way for you to take control to have the best life possible. Nobody is saying like these are terrible things in and of themselves. We're saying they're annoying if you don't know what is happening to you. There is potential for you to get weaker if you don't take action. But who doesn't want to take action? Well, yeah, you've opened up a question that is a really big one. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't take action. I think everybody mm. wants to take action, but mm. if you look around in America, it's a big problem, right? Obesity. It's a big problem. Frailty. It's, you know, I'm really hoping this, this generation and then after really changes that. I don't disagree with I you, really but I think hope. that's I'm also hopeful. because... I'm hopeful, but I think what you're saying is truly due to socioeconomic diversity and struggle. And a lot of, you know, health is for the wealthy at this stage. Wellness is for the wealthy. That is what we also have to change. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want more control and more power over the way in which they age, and they simply don't have the information in order to do it in a healthy and safe way. I couldn't agree more. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Stacey. We're a first world country. Come on. I mean, if we it's, don't it's, do it's this, mind blowing. Who, who is? Mm -hmm. It's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Listen, I could go on and on talking with you. And, you know, you, I just like, I, I think we have to, I don't know, end it at some point. I don't want to. <laughs> but first of all, before I, I ask my final question, I just want mm -hmm. you to promise that you'll come back again for another chat because I would there's a lot more. I want to talk about, and I feel that'd be really fun to have kind of like a check-in with you just to see oh how God, you think sure. things are evolving, especially for after sure. this big day that we're, uh, we, we, see, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we, yes. well, it's we. <laughs> you are having on uh, no. October 18th, all of us together. No, Barbara, so, it's we. It we, is yeah. we. All of us together. The whole point of that summit isn't just the CEOs. It is everybody from the press and every person of influence that we know is working within this sphere to help change things. Mm -hmm. And it is a we. And mm -hmm. I would love to come back whenever you'll have me. Oh, yeah. No, this is this is too much fun. And I also do want to ask you some style questions, but not today. <laughs> it's been just so great. And, you know, I applaud you as I did before. I'll do it again. Yay! All the work that you're doing, the good work you and your team are doing to push this conversation forward. But before I let you go, do you have like maybe three key takeaways you really want? Oh, we talked about a lot of things, but three mm -hmm. that you would really like the Gruff Talk listeners to remember from today's chat. Yeah. If I had to say it definitively, that menopause is not an ending, it is a transition. And if you think about it in terms of, I, I wear my necklace all the time that says, and... I noticed and, that. I saw that right? on, you know, thank you for bringing, I was going to ask you, what is that? Tell us. So it's another company that I started with a friend um, called 21 Grams. But and for me is a word that just resonated. And my friend Jenna Arnold was telling me that she was, she'd been sort of making fake jewelry for herself. And she took out this necklace and gave it to me. And I said, we need to start this company. We need to make them right now. Because the word itself is so hopeful. It is. And, and it's like a semicolon, not a period, right? And more than one thing can be true at the same time. You can be struggling with aging and still be proud of it. You can be struggling with health issues and still want to be strong. Like all of these things can be true all at the same time. You can say you've never felt better or more confident or know who you are and still be bummed if you walk down the street and nobody makes eyes at you. All of these things are true. And the thing is not to get caught up in the positive or the negative of them, but just the reality of them. 
and also stands for a new dawn, a new day. I'm on my fourth career. And, 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 like bring it. It's just more and more. And I cannot tell you, so many people stopped me about this necklace that I was like, we've got to go into production because and is like the middle age mantra. That is and so it be. great. That is so, that's so great. Thing. I would say, think of menopause as an and, not an end. An oh, and, wow. that, not that an great, end. That, that was, was great. great. You're going to yeah. use that. <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> oh, I love it's it. It's an and, not an end. And oh, I say this all the time. Menopause can be hard. It can feel hard mm -hmm. culturally, socially, physically, emotionally, all of it. But it isn't hopeless. And my company really is here. We are dedicated to helping you navigate this phase of your life. Because once you have navigation tools, you've got your arsenal set. You really do. And it will allow you to not only have a better quality of your daily life, it's just going to allow you to have a better quality of your life. It's an inevitability for us. So if we treat it as such, just like aging, instead of saying anti-aging, let's not say anti-menopause right? I mean, that's the way we behave. Nobody just uses that term. But accepting of all of the phases and really, as long as we have a more comprehensive understanding of our hormonal physiology, just from birth to death, yeah. we're all going to be better off and be able to contextualize menopause in a way that makes sense, that makes it just as natural as any other part of our lives. Well done, Stacey. And you've got to use that and even more I think oh, I just see sure. it. Oh my gosh. It's I just funny. see it. You know, you've yeah. got to, you've got to focus you and your team have got to like get it out there more and more. That is so great. And so powerful. Some, a little three letter word like that we is do. so powerful. Such meanings. And, and I will say the other one we're doing is yet. Yet. Yeah. This of because course both, promise. Well, oh yeah. Hey, so I'm not done yet. Yeah. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Yes. And I think that sometimes when we beat ourselves up for what we haven't done or haven't accomplished mm -hmm. or haven't reached the goal, remember goals are always on the horizon. You meet one, you're, you're going to reach for another that feels too far away. All I feel is that if you say yet, then you believe enough in where you're going to know that it'll happen eventually. And so it's the way I feel about menopause, right? We're just not there yet in how accepting we are of this incredibly natural transition in our lives, but we will be. And. <laughs> On that note. And scene. <laughs> <laughs> it was just great talking with you. And I Thank know we'll so have you back again because this was fun. I think you had yeah. fun. And you I certainly, so you shared so much great information. So looking forward to seeing you on October 18th to celebrate oh. this very special day. And I, I just can't wait. I look forward to having you back on the show again, Stacey. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Rough Talk, please do two things. First, share it with all your friends and family and subscribe to Gruff Talk wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Until next time, remember this. We can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice, women's voices amplified.